Her and my mother-in-law both lived in Freeport. Right. So as a result, why we didn't move up here until about 90 when uh -huh. we had to put them in the nursing home. So uh, right. Uh, that's when we moved up and we put the grapes in and. 79 uh -huh. and uh, the blueberries in and about 87 88 right and so had peaches also but they've all died on me so <laughs> right now we got berries and grapes i understand it's the best blueberries anywhere well that's what the guy in the paper said wasn't it? <laughs> yeah we uh we appreciate him he, i didn't even know he was going to put all that stuff in there he talked to the wife and then all of a sudden, we, he evidently writes for both the Austin Statesman and the Brian Eagle. Right. And so he put all that stuff in there. Right, yeah. I, w I went on the internet this morning and I read, uh, I read something. Well, the first thing I want to ask you, are, are, you a, are you a descendant of, of General Lawrence Dezavala? Well, I don't know where the general is, but uh, Lorenzo De Zavala was my great great grandfather. Okay, because I read I read all about him. They called him a general. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, he. Uh, He's your great great grandfather. That's right. I'll be darned. That's right. And uh, so we know all about him. And uh, right. He. Uh, this is my wife, Mr. Hi, Rachel. How are you? I'm fine. I'm Tom Turbyville. Pleasure to meet you. How are you? I'm doing fine. Thank good. you. Good. 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 That's great. Well, no, I was reading about about him and and his. Uh, they, there was even a, a school named after him in San Antonio, well, right? There's all kinds. All of kinds of things named. There's named one after named in San Marcos after him. There's right. people named in Houston after him. Yeah. And that kind of thing. There's a county out in West Texas, Zavala County. Right. And then, uh, so, yeah, he was uh, quite an intelligent individual I and mean, quite a, a doer. So did you learn much about him when you were young? Did your, did your my, dad ever know him or did your granddad no, ever, no, did your granddad know him? No. No. no? My, my, my even, I didn't even know my great grandfather, which I was see. Ricardo. Yeah. Uh, and uh, Ricardo was just a boy when Lorenzo died. He I died see. in in 36 he right. had the year of the the, the change of sentence right and so uh, on that basis uh they were raised uh, uh the wife emily remarried a man by the name of folk i see and they she lived in the dezavala homestead and she had children uh -huh. by folk and then uh, this was her third husband and then he died and she remarried again i see uh, but uh, Ricardo and Augustine were the two children that, uh, and Emily died earlier. Right. And Ricardo and Augustine were the two boys that lived. Yeah. And Augustine then uh, married and had Augustine Jr. and Mary and Adina. I see. And Adina was the one who saved the Alamo. She's the one that locked herself in the Alamo to keep the bulldozers from tearing it down. Right. Got enough notoriety to where right. they, they decided not. I remember that story. So yeah. that was a, a cousin, and yeah. she was a school teacher. Uh -huh. And she wanted me to study history. She offered to send me to school and if I'd study history. Right. I didn't want to study history. <laughs> so uh, I ended up uh, being a metallurgist. Yeah. Uh, and. Uh, well, tell me about where you grew up and 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 all of that, and 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 uh, sort of how that led to your uh, okay. to your service and I, uh, and your your military service, and sort of take me from take me from there. My great grandfather Ricardo uh -huh. was born at Lynchburg, which is right there at the San Jacinto battleground. Right. Used to be a ferry. I don't know whether they still have a ferry there or not. Uh huh. Uh, they have one at uh, at Bolivar. Is that it would no, it be the no, same one there? No, no, not that's not not the no, same this thing. This is okay. up uh, at Lynchburg across the Buffalo Bayou. Okay. That it is. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Uh, he, Ricardo, married and had one son, and his wife died, and then uh, he remarried and had four sons. Mm -hmm. And I'm from that lineage. Henry was one of the sons of the second marriage. I see. And uh, then Henry was raised there at Lynchburg. My grandfather used to tell me when he was a boy, they'd go playing and go down into the 
of gullies around there and dig up swords and old pistols from the war. Really? And hide. Wow. And so that's what he uh, used to tell me all that. And then when they finished with them, they'd throw them back. I'll be darned. Yeah, and then, then they kept the same. Anyway. <laughs> that's Henry, too bad. Henry was raised there, and uh, Henry took, along with a, a bunch of herders, took a a herd of cattle to New Orleans to, to sell, to ship out. And while he was in New Orleans, he met a Louisiana belle by the name of Mary Devaney. Uh -huh. He married her, and he brought her back to Texas, and he settled on 320 acres. He got a, a grant there at, at Lynchburg, right where the San Jacinto Battleground is now. Mm -hmm. and, uh, of course, it, Mary was raised in the city, and this was country and farm and mosquitoes. And uh -huh. after about three months, so the story goes, she said, "Henry, I'm going back to New Orleans. You coming?" Uh <laughs> so they uh, they moved back to New Orleans. In the meantime, his older half brother Ricardo uh, had gone to work for uh, Texas and Pacific Railroad in New Orleans. So he got Henry a job there in New Orleans, but. On the railroad, you go wherever you were needed, and so Henry ended up as an engineer, and he was on the cane run up around Plaquemine, and that's where my father was born, mm -hmm. in Plaquemine, Louisiana. Mm -hmm. And my mother was French. She was born in Napoleonville, and she couldn't speak English till she went to school, six years old. Really? All they spoke was French. They right. don't buy La Fouche. Right. And so, uh, they moved to Gretna, and that's where my father met her, and they married. And then uh, in 1925, I was born in September. And then uh, I guess it was in October, there was a big recession, and Dad got out of a job, and so Henry had a sister. I said there were four boys, there were four children by the part of the second marriage. He had a sister living in Houston, and so she wrote to my grandfather and says, send Lawrence over here, that was my dad's name also, mm -hmm. and I think we can find him some work and they can stay with us. And so I was nine months old when mother and dad picked up New Orleans and uh, moved to Houston. I see. So I was raised in Houston. Right, basically. right, okay. My father went to work for Dow in 1940. We moved to Freeport, and then I graduated from Freeport High School in 1942, uh -huh. uh, joined the Air Force a week before I was 18, so I wouldn't have to go in the infantry. I didn't think I'd like the infantry, uh -huh. and so then I I was uh, sent to Shepherd Field in Wichita Falls for my basic training, and then uh, flunked out of uh, cadet school, failed my physical, uh -huh. and. Uh, but I went to radio school in Sioux Falls, South Dakota in the winter and went to gunnery school at Yuma, Arizona in the summer. I see. So uh, then I was assigned to a, a crew and we took our training at Marchfield, California. Uh, and then from March... What year would that have been now? Where, where are we? Oh, here? that year was 1944. Okay. Yeah, 1944. I graduated from high school in 42. Right. And I uh, worked a couple of years on construction before I turned 18. Uh-huh. Lied about my age, but I was big, so... Right. And, of course, there were any, any warm body down in that part of the country that needed that would work, they'd hire them because right. people were short in the war. And then... In 1944, in December, I uh, bought my wife uh, an engagement ring out in California, and she and my mother and dad came out to visit me over Christmas uh, in 44. They put us on a train, sent us to Hamilton Field, San Francisco, and hot dog, we're going to the Pacific. Then they issued us all Army uh, wools and heavy clothing, put us on the train, and eight days later we ended up in Newport News, Virginia. Uh-oh. Oh, that's not in the direction of the Pacific. <laughs> no, that's not. So they put us on. We were there for three days, so they marched us and put us on the boat, and uh, we took off on our own SS America 
no convoy or anything because it was a fast ship. It was faster than most subs. Mm -hmm. And so we ended up in Naples. And then I was sent to the uh, replacement depot and then uh, I was sent to a, a bomber group uh, stationed out of uh, west of Brindisi. In Italy? In Italy, in mm -hmm. Adriatic. And uh, the procedure was when new crews came in, the pilot flew as a co-pilot with an experienced crew for two missions. And then he took his crew from then on. He was a, so he had experience, two mm -hmm. missions. Right. So we flew then out of Italy into Germany and to... Italy. You were a radio man, right? I was radio operator gunner. Radio operator gunner. Uh-huh. On what what kind B, of airplanes? B twenty four. B twenty four. Yeah, the B twenty four four engine. Right. Twin tail. Right. And so. Uh, right. I think one of those landed out here landed at Easterwood, out at Easterwood uh, last month or so ago. I didn't get a chance so to go out and see it. Right. Uh, but uh, we flew uh, nineteen or twenty one missions as a crew, and then the war was over in May. Right. Of. Forty five. Forty five. Right. Uh, our pilot came by our tent one day and said, Say, I got a chance to get a brand new 24, never been in combat, and we're going to fly it home. Y'all want to go? Damn right, let's go. <laughs> so we flew from Italy to Marrakech, Africa, stayed there a couple of days, and flew from there to the Azores, stayed overnight at the Azores, and then from there we went into Ganderfield, Newfoundland. Uh huh. And then from Ganderfield, Newfoundland, we flew to Bradley Field in Connecticut. Right. And uh, we were so concerned about all of us had been issued a brand new 45 automatic when it San, San Francisco, and we all wanted to keep them, of course. And of course, the government didn't want you to do that, but they were getting pretty horsey about stripping you down when you came back. Mm -hmm. So we all landed in Bradley Field and we got into the hangar with all our satchels and suitcases and, and bags. And the guy said, what you don't want, put in that corner, what you want to keep, take with you. Goodbye. So I liberated my 45 and then about eight or nine years ago, had a Mexican man working for me that stole it. Oh, really? He stole a bunch of my guns. Oh, my goodness. I yeah. had that serial number, and I still keep the serial number active right. from a stolen thing. But anyway, right. it was a uh, Colt 45 Patton, but it was made by Singer Sewing Machine during the war. I'll be darned. Yeah. Huh. So, uh, well, tell me about your mission. You, you said 24 missions? How many missions? Uh, 21. 21 missions. We flew into Yugoslavia. We flew into Austria. Linz, Austria, uh, Vienna, Austria, Wiener Neustadt in Germany, a couple other places in Germany, Zagreb, Yugoslavia. I can't remember them all, but uh, we were flying as part of the 379th bomb group and we'd fly out over the Adriatic and then go straight up the Adriatic over the water until we get to whatever point they wanted and then they'd head inland. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, What were your missions? Mostly you... rail yards and bridges. To take them out? To take them out. Mm -hmm. uh, did you meet a lot of resistance? Were you in we, some We met a lot of flak. We never did get jumped by fighters. We were, the, the German Air Force was just about kaput by that time. Right. But we were also protected with P-51s by the Tus Tuskegee Flyers, the Black Flyers. Exactly, Tuskegee Air Group. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Tuskegee Air, and they were good. Yes, sir. And so we appreciated them. I've read a lot about them. Yeah, and I saw they, they put out a movie a few years ago yes, called the Tuskegee did. Airmen uh -huh. that I've seen a couple of times. It's yeah. an excellent movie. Yeah, and they, and they, so you were one of the groups that was protected yeah, by them. Yeah, we sure were. And, uh, Did you get to know any of them, or were they mainly no, no, just, they, 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 were, they, were, they were other they places, were so y'all never north. landed they together. They were further anything. north and, and on the coast, uh, on the Adriatic coast. Right. So they'd uh, meet us, and we'd see them, 
you know, they're, they're up there waiting for something to jump us. Right. Uh, my nose gunner uh, saw an ME-262. That was that German jet plane. Mm -hmm. He popped up about four miles in front, or five miles ahead, through the clouds and then went right back down and we never saw him again. Right. He never made no attack. Flak was very heavy, uh, especially if you're going into uh, Germany, we'd have to go over the mountains and of course they were sitting at about 10 or 12,000 feet with their guns and we were at 22, so the difference there wasn't all that much. So the mm -hmm. flak was, was pretty tough. Yeah. Uh, you saw the black smoke of the thing exploding. It was fairly close, but when you saw the red puff of the explosion, it was damn close. Mm -hmm. And uh, it would shake the plane. Part of my job was to dump chaff, which was aluminum foil, tin foil. We'd dump out of the back end of the plane because that screwed up their radar. I see. And so uh, the pilot would come on and tell me, Lawrence, time to start dumping. So I, I, it was it was packaged in triangular cardboard. It looked like icicles on a Christmas tree is what it looked like. Uh -huh. And it was loose and you'd, we had a slot on the side of the, the plane for it. And you just slip it out there about every minute you'd put it out. And that supposedly would screw up their radar and as far as height is concerned. I see. So. Uh, so you were in charge of dumping that. Yes. Yeah. They, so you were you were situated on the B twenty four in the in the rear. And the waist. It's in the waist. Okay. It had two. It had two windows, two waist windows, one on either side. Mm -hmm. And the way the squadrons flew, you had the number one plane, and then the number two and the number three. They were all wingtip to wingtip. Right. Then the number four was underneath the number one and then the five and the six and then uh, this number seven and generally the, you flew in each squadron had anywhere from nine to twelve planes uh -huh. it depended upon how many they could get ready for the next day right and so when we flew on this side i'd man the left waist gun because the, the the right waist gun was facing your your other other airplane and we they flew them close they the pilot said, when you flying out there, the, the head honcho of the group says, I want to see that wing stuck in the window of that other plane. And they did. They mm -hmm. put them close. Two reasons for that. One, with tight formations like that, you put up a pretty formidable uh, screen of, of 50 caliber bullets if any fighters would jump you. Mm -hmm. Secondly, you were close because the only guy that looked through the bomb site was that lead squadron guy, and when he toggled, when he set his off, the rest of them toggled on him. Now, they set everything in advance to release one at a time every second or every half second or all at once or what have you. But anyway, the we had a bombardier aboard, but the, the nose gunner did most of the bombing because he and the bombardier would hand him the button right and say hey when they tr you're watching because he's flying right close and he's watching your bomb bays are open right so when they toggled off why well, he toggled off yeah so you keep them close together and you get a better bomb pattern right so as a as a as a, as a gunner did you have to use your gun a lot Never used it at all. Really? Except to, to test fire right. every morning. Yeah. When you when you flew. Yeah. Oh, okay. Oh, look at that! Wow. Yeah, gracias, señor. Need a fifty blueberries. Pick the blueberries. Wow, look at those. Oh man. Can you just eat them? Sure. They had no spray on them. Mmm. Whoop. That was good. Sour. A little sour, but yep. that's good. Yeah. Mm. Those are delicious. Uh, now we uh, we fired twin fifties. Yeah. Mounted in the waist, and they had uh, uh, just the ring gun sights. Uh huh. Uh, we were trained. We went through six weeks of gunnery school to where you trained uh, 
a bomber flying along and a fighter plane to, to come at that, just like if you go hunt ducks, you got to shoot ahead of that duck. Right. Because when the duck and the shell get there, then you get him. Right. Well, if a guy, a fighter plane would come from the side and to aim ahead of that bomber, he'd give one burst and then that's it. He, he, because either he's behind him or he's in front of him or the guy's moved. So the fighters flew into what they called a pursuit curve. Mm -hmm. What they did, they came around and they cocked her up and they aimed ahead of it and they just stayed aiming ahead of it all the time as they closed in. Now, that was his best chance of shooting you down. Mm -hmm. But that was also our best chance of hitting him because he was in a definite pattern and we knew where he was going to be. Right. So we were trained to do that. We were right. trained to shoot at him that way right. and to, to lead him. The further out he was, the more you lead him, the closer he got back angle, the less you led him. Yeah, right. And so as a result of that, why? But we had twin 50s and they had uh, uh, gun heaters on them because it, most of the time we were at 20 to 25 below zero mm -hmm. up there. Yeah. 22, 23,000 feet. Right. And so uh, we had gun heaters. Right. They were good hand warmers too. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> I'll bet. And, uh, but part of our job was to, uh, as we got in the air and flew, the, the pilots would generally tell us, time to charge your guns and then we'd charge them, you had to charge them twice, each one in order to uh, put a shell in the chamber mm -hmm. and then be sure that the, the belts were clear and, and the feed and everything was all right on the gun. You, you generally didn't fool with the gun on the inside, you fool with the one you were going to handle. If you were on the other side, then you fool with the right one. Yeah. Also, the waste gun, gunner's job was to as we flew to our mission, we did not drop the ball turret. We had hydraulic ball turrets. Uh, hydraulic mean they were operated hydraulic, but you had to hand pump them. Mm -hmm. So we did not drop our ball turrets until after the rally. After you dropped your bombs and the, the group rallied, then you dropped, the, my job was to get the ball turret gunner get him situated in there, get him hooked up, okay, lock him in, and then let him down. And all it was was a matter of letting the hydraulic pressure off and then he would drop down. I see. And then once we reached in 10,000 feet on the way back, then my job was then to pump him back up mm -hmm. and let him out. I see. So most missions lasted anywhere from 10 to 14 hours. I see. They were long. Yeah, they were. And then when you, where were you stationed at this time? Where'd you go uh, back to? We, we, we were stationed at uh, a little Italian town called San Pancrazio, which was due west of Brindisi, about 50 miles in the heel of the boot. Mm -hmm. You know how Italy is mm -hmm. in the boot. Right. Brindisi's on the Adriatic, and we were west of Brindisi, about 50 miles. I see. We had a, a four squadrons to the group, Group. We were the only group on this airfield, and we had mat runways that, you know, these steel mats had locked in, and that was the runway. Right. We were in the midst of a vino patch. Yeah. <laughs> they, they were uh, grapevines all around. I see. And so uh, <laughs> then uh, when they sent the, three, <clears throat> the 379th back, uh, I, our crew was in the middle. They sent the four lead crews that had the most missions, and then the eight uh, crews that had none or very few missions, they sent them back to train in 29. Mm -hmm. That was it. So we were right in the middle. I see. Each squadron had in up to 12 planes. Each squadron had up to 30 to 40 crews. So you flew every third day about what it amounted to. I see. If they managed 12 planes, and you flew every third day. If they managed just eight planes, you flew every fourth day. Right. If the weather knocked you out, why, well, you, you skipped a day. And, right. And of course, we were there in the wintertime. And what was the weather like? I mean, was it? Cold. Yeah. Uh, we were in a tent. We had a, a 
tufa block. We were in the country, they, they dug a lot of tufa block, which is 8 by 8 by 16. It's like a concrete block, but it's a pumice stone, and they dug it as, as bricks. And then what we'd do, we'd sack it up four foot high and then put a tent, a uh, post in the middle and put a tent over that. Mm -hmm. and so we were, for, for heat, we had a uh, two five gallon cans with the bottoms cut out and welded together and a, a metal saucer in the middle with a oil line going in there dripping oil. Right. And uh, when we'd run out of oil, heating oil, we'd go steal 100 octane gas, and mm -hmm. that made it pretty dangerous, but it kept you warm. Right, right. So uh, now, most of your missions were into into Germany. Or uh, most where, where of, most, they, most of they our into? missions were into uh, uh, Austria. Austria, okay. Lens, Vienna, and then Zagreb, which is Yugoslavia. Right. Uh, and then any uh, any number of. Uh, towns and communities around there in Austria where they had rail yards. Polesti oil fields were destroyed and, and taken by the Russians by the time I got there, so uh -huh. we didn't fly that that mission. So your missions were more to cut off their cut off their supplies, their, 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 supplies, their, their, their supplies. travel. Their, then toward the end of the yeah. war we flew uh, a number of missions into northern Italy trying to bomb bridges and so forth to keep the German from retreating right. so they could trap them in there. I see. So uh, the last few missions are, are one that we didn't really relish at all flying. We flew at 12,000 feet and that's pretty low for her. The German gunners were good. Yeah. They, they're good. They, they had lots of experience and they were, they were good. Uh, so we, uh, the B-17 pilots that would come in there I think they had one or two squadrons of 17s in Italy. Boy, they they said y'all are crazy flying to 22,000. We go up to 27, 28. We go high. Uh huh. Makes it harder for them to hit us. Right. But at any rate, we we flew in northern Italy, and then when the war was over, uh, we and that was that was the only time that our crew dreaded to fly. We were ready to fly every day if they would let us. Mm -hmm. But toward the end of the war we could see it was just about over and here you go up on a bombing mission on the front lines and you're flying at 10 to 12,000 feet and you get shot down three days before the war is over. That mm -hmm. don't do very much for you. No. So we, but we did. We right. flew. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, so you were lucky. Yeah, we were. Yeah. I was very lucky. Yeah. Nobody on my crew ever got hurt. Yeah. Uh, from from flak or anything. We've come back and counted a many a hole in our airplane uh, where the flak had gone through it. And uh, if it's close enough, it goes through both walls of the of the airplane, and you can hear it. Boom! Bing! It goes through both sides, and you hope you're not in the middle. <laughs> you heard some of that? Oh yes. Some of that flak would. Yeah. Yeah, as I say, we're very nope. lucky. Yeah. Nobody got hit, uh, ever got hit. One of the, uh, I guess it was the tail gunner, had some flak rattle around his uh, tail turret, but never did hit him. I'll be darned. And so we were, we had a reunion of our crew, I guess about 15 years ago. Mm -hmm. Where? In St. Louis. Mm -hmm. One of our crew, the navigator, ended up going to George Washington University and majoring in civil engineering and became a big time contractor. And he had lots of money and so what he'd do with his contractor crew in the slack times, he'd furnish a contractor crew to build motels in various places. He'd furnish the labor to do that. Somebody would furnish the money, somebody else would furnish the land and he became a third interest owner in lots of motels and hotels over the United States. Mm -hmm. So he put it all together. He's yeah. still living, by the way. I think he's 85. I'll be darned. And uh, I, I still hear from him every yeah. Christmas. Uh, his name was Jones. Yeah. And uh, we had it in St. Louis. And when we had it, let's see, we had everybody, I think there was eight of us that got back together. They, uh, 
the engineer of our crew was an old man. He was 35. Mm -hmm. And he was no, he called, we called him Pop. Yeah. <laughs> and they, they, uh, the upper turret gunner uh, by the name of Wrigley, we don't know where he was. We couldn't find him. Right. But everybody else they found, and out of the eight, it's kind of unusual. I think it's unusual. Out of the eight that came back from overseas, Pop got killed, oh, two years after the war was over. He mm -hmm. was a pretty heavy drinker, and mm -hmm. he ran into a train, or a train ran into him. Mm -hmm. uh, but out of the eight of us, seven of us got degrees. I'll be darned. Pretty unusual. Yeah. They, uh, yeah. One of them stayed in the service. Right. The co-pilot and retired as a lieutenant colonel. Right. Uh, the rest of us all got out and went to school. So you came home, came back home to Texas? I came back from Bradley Field. They sent me to Fort Sam and gave me a 30-day furlough, and that's when I got married. I see. I uh, got married, and I got home about June the 10th and June the 16th. I oh, 45? My, yeah, 45. Mm -hmm. I asked my wife, I says, uh, what do you want to do? You want to get married? She said, I'm ready. So uh, we got married and had our honeymoon and ended up at a little place up in Curville, out of Curville, uh, Heart of the Hills Inn. Uh -huh. I, know, there, I know exactly where that is. When yeah. we got there, there were seven honeymoon couples. Is that right? <laughs> <laughs> and uh, then I, I had to go back to California for reassignment, and I felt, felt I was going to be assigned to 29s and go to the Pacific or go to training. Uh -huh. And uh, the cutoff was 100 and 275 combat hours, and I had 276 and a half. I'd be darned. Boy, I just barely made it. So they <laughs> sent me back to Foster Field in Victoria, uh -huh. which was a, a fighter base, and I was part of the ground crew radio, and my job, I worked the evening shift. My job was to climb in all of the fighters and check the radios out for the next day. I see. And then, uh, that was they, then I got a furlough, and then uh, we, wife and I, moved to Victoria, and I guess about the war was over in August, I right. guess. Right, forty-five. Uh huh. And we had, we were very fortunate with the Air Force. If you flew over and bombed into an area where they gave a battle star for, if you flew in that area and dropped bombs during a particular time, you got a, a battle star. And every battle star was worth five points towards your getting out of the service. I see. So uh, I had uh, I had about ninety points by October, and so I got discharged in October. October forty-five. Forty-five. I see. Uh, school had already started. I wanted to be a metallurgist. Uh, two schools in Texas offered that. A&M was one of them, and UT El Paso was the other. Uh -huh. I'd had my belly full of the Army. Right. I didn't want, but I also realized, and I didn't have to get into the Corps. Right, because you'd already... Then, I'd already been in the service. Exactly. But I felt if you went to A&M and you didn't go in the Corps, you missed both, most of it. Right. So I decided not to go to A&M. And so you went, went to, to El Paso? El Paso. Uh-huh. And didn't know a soul out there. And my wife and I loaded up a little 36 Ford coupe, and away we went. She worked and put me through school. My oldest child, my daughter, was born out in El Paso. Yeah. And uh, then I went to work part-time, uh, or after I graduated there. I graduated in 49, in the summer of 49. I had one chemistry class that I had to get before I could graduate. Uh -huh. And so uh, I finished up that summer and then graduated in August. I was an only child and my mother and dad looked forward to their only son walking across the stage for getting his degree. Mm -hmm. So we all went back out to El Paso and uh, I couldn't get, I sent out 27 resumes to various companies looking for work. Mm -hmm. In those days, you didn't have uh, the placement office at the college. Right. And so uh, I just found the names and wrote to them and 
sent my grades, copies, and information, and a, a resume. Got one offer of a job in Salt Lake City with a uh, steel company. Forget the name of it now. Allegheny Ludlam Steel in Salt Lake City, Provo, Utah. Mm -hmm. Offered me a job as Metallurgy C in their rolling mill. At shift work, but it was at so many dollars, so, so much money. And I wrote back and asked them what was the chances for, how long did you have to work on shift work? Uh, and uh, what were the chances for advancement? And I got a nice letter back from them saying, the job we tentatively offered you has been filled by a local man. Thank uh -huh. you. <laughs> I took both the letters, the one they offered me the job. It was a complete offer, pride, money, and everything. Where to report to? I took them both to my dean of engineering and showed them to him. And he said, Lawrence, you can hold their feet to the fire if you want to with the, like this letter. Right. He said, they'll have to hire you. Yeah. He says, uh, I wouldn't give you a chance to the two hoots in hell if you go to work for them, <laughs> if you force them. So I said, okay. So. Uh, then uh, graduation night at the reception after the graduation, he uh, he saw me. He said, "Well, where are you? You got a job?" I said, "No, I don't have anything yet." He said, "Well, I hear Phelps Dodge, just a local copper refinery there in El Paso, are looking for for folks." So he said, "Why don't you uh, give them a call?" So I did. I called him, and, and the guy says. Uh, Oh, I guess it was an afternoon I called him and the guy said, yeah, he said, why don't you be out here by about uh, 7 o'clock and bring you lunch? If, you, if you, we hire you, we'll hire you. So, man, that's great. Went out to Phelps Dodge, talked to the doctor. He took all the vital signs and everything and then he says, step up on this stool 10 times for me, would you? So I did and he listened. He said, sit down for a minute. He said, step on the stool again. I did. He listened. Third time he did, I said, what's the matter, Doc? Something wrong? He said, yeah, you got a heart murmur. I'm sorry, son, but we can't hire you. Oh, my. Oh, my God. Yeah, I spent four years going to school and everything and then come out and find I got a health problem. So I went back home and both my wife's parents and my parents were there. What's the matter? And I told him, and we all like to have a hissy. Well, I got a hold of a heart doctor that afternoon, made an appointment for the next day. I told him I was an emergency. I needed to find out something. So I went to see him, and he took a picture of the heart and let my wife watch it bead, and he checked everything. He said, Miss Disbali said, I don't find anything wrong. I don't hear a heart murmur. I said, well, would you mind calling this other doctor and tell him? He said, well, he's down about three floors. He said, I'll give him a call. So I went down to see him again. He checked me again, and he couldn't find it. He said, yeah, if you want to come to work, come to work in the morning. I'll be darned. So I went to work for Phil well, Dodge. that second opinion paid off. It sure did. <laughs> so uh, I worked for Phelps Dodge. I had applied to Dow and everybody else. I really wanted to go, I, would, I had been in construction, I'd been a welder, and I really wanted to go for go to work for Lincoln Electric uh -huh. and do experimental work, welding work, and so that was the one company I never did hear from. Right. They didn't, I did everybody else answered me and thanked me and said no. Um, then the one steel company, and then from... Uh, Phelps Dodge, you, I worked in the tank house, which is sulfuric acid, and uh, you had to wear wool all the time. And it was uh, cooler in the summer than it was in the winter there for the simple reason that you could open all the windows and get a draft through there in the summer because it didn't keep the liquor cool. Mm -hmm. In the winter, you had to keep the liquor warm. So I got an offer from Dow Chemical to go to work on uh, two days before Christmas of 1949. I see. 
And I... Where was that? At Freeport, Texas. In Freeport, okay. Where I... My dad still worked for him. So how long were you in El Paso working for... Oh, just four months. Okay. Yeah, from, from August until uh, December. And your folks still lived in... In Freeport. In yeah. Freeport. Yeah. So you got to go home. Got to go home. Yeah. I went to work for Dow on January the 9th, 1950. And worked for him for 34 and a half years. I'll be there. And uh, had a good job, I thought. Yeah. Uh, ended up in mid-management and uh, was treated well and uh, bought Dow stock every chance I could get. They'd offer it to me, and that's what bought this place for me. I'll be there. So I retired, took early retirement in 84. I see. And then uh, we had this place in 74. Uh huh. And uh, we didn't move up here until 90. I see. So we've been here then ever since. Did, was this house all here? Did you build this house? or? No. Uh, that part of that end was a long barracks. This was part of the barracks. They used to have uh, German prisoners of war in, in Hearn. Right, sir. Hot diggity dog. They did some picking. Oh my goodness, look at that. <laughs> I stayed out there too long. How about some ice water? I just, we just sat there and finished our water. Oh, okay, just set them up there. Unless you fill them up with just tap water. Where are you at? Well, he's off mine. <laughs> well, I'll have to find him. Uh, yeah. He's got the, 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 he's got the your uh, service young picture. One and he's got also when we celebrated our 62nd anniversary. We okay. celebrated our 50th anniversary here. I see. And uh, we had a big, we, we built a dance floor, and yeah. we had a band, and we had a dance, and we had a blowout. Yeah. Here. When was that picture taken there? Uh, that was taken uh, two years ago, I guess, a year ago, December. Uh-huh. Uh, yeah. Uh, You never call his name. Uh, local guy he used to work at A and M. He used to be uh huh. Uh, the photographer, you mean? Uh, the, the, the guy that wrote the article. Oh, oh uh, Jerry Cooper. Ed, Ed Cooper. Oh, Ed Cooper. Okay. Ed Cooper. Yeah, yeah. He used to be public relations at A and M. He right. was the president's liaison man or something like that. Yeah. So Ed's done a number of articles on us. In fact, he put us in the Franklin News Weekly here last Thursday a week ago. Yeah. I didn't know he was going to do it. He came out to buy some blackberries, uh -huh. took a couple of pictures, and wrote us a nice article. Then this one showed up in the Bryan paper. Yeah. I've been getting all kinds of publicity. <laughs> it's great. So when the, how do you know uh, Uncle Al? Al Hansen. You know Al? Because Al's the one that told me about yeah, you. I know. I know. Yeah. Al, uh, Al called me when my picture, Youngkins, appeared uh -huh. in the paper. Right. He went to radio school in Sioux Falls, South Dakota also. Right. Okay. But he was a year ahead of me. Okay. And because, uh, and then so I stopped by, he told me where he lived, and I stopped by to visit him, called him one day. Uh -huh. My wife had a dental appointment, so while she was there, I called him, and he said, yeah, come on by. He's something, isn't he? He's a character. He's a character. Yeah, he really is. Yeah, that's. Uh, I met a lot of uh, veterans on his uh, on his porch. Yeah, back there. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I went up to the front door and I rang. And <laughs> you won't find him at the front I door. I got my <laughs> cell phone. Called him again. I said, "Hey, I'm on your front porch." Oh, he said, "Hell, come to the back." Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. He's back there. Whether it was there anybody else there when you no, went? Nobody was there. Oh, you must have gone a little later in the day, I guess. Oh, in, well, it was in the, 9, 9:30. Was it? Well, yeah. Okay. Earlier in the morning, you'll find Dr. Cooper there and some other people that uh, that are there. He's my doctor, Dr. Cooper. And uh, had, a, yeah. had a guy come by this morning that uh, he came to pick blueberries. He lives in Bryan. Uh, and I noticed on his uh, bumper, he said the pilot's class of 1944. Uh -huh. And I figured he was Air Force and uh, uh, I told him, I says, uh, what did you fly in? And he said, well, I was a B-24 pilot in the 7th Air Force in the Pacific. I said, oh, I was a 
B-24 radio operator Gunner in Italy. <laughs> I'll be But darn. I had so damn much business this morning, we really didn't, didn't get, get a chance, chance to, to talk. Visit. Oh, he, my goodness. He wrote down his the name. name and everything? Oh, yeah. And where is he from? From Brian? Brian, yeah. What's his name? Mike. Well, let's see. He said he put down a B-24 pilot. Yeah. Bill Woodings. Bill Woodings, okay. 2627 Lockenvar Lane. B-24 pilot. Yeah, he's a B-24 pilot in the 7th Air Force in the Pacific. Bill Woodings on Lockenvar and Brian. Bill yeah. Woodings, okay. You want to write yeah. that down? No, I, I've got it here. Okay. I, I just set it here in my, into my recorder, so I might okay. give him a call and, and get up. You know, I just saw a name of a person I know, and I saw her when I was driving in. Uh, Kathy Lyle. Kathy Lyle. Yeah, I just, I, you know, she passed me when I was moved, when I was driving out, and I looked over there and said, that's Kathy Lyle. So, yeah, yeah well, I Kathy her. is the daughter of good friends of ours. Her mother and dad is diving inches. Uh-huh. You know, they have their... Uh, right. Uh, yeah. Tax her place in Norman G. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I saw Kathy. Yeah. And I think Kathy, I think Kathy's doing well now. Oh, yeah. I think she's, she's doing, doing yeah, she's so doing very she, well. I think she, she fought that bout with fought, cancer and she just sure doing did. great. She yeah. sure did. I think, I think she and Sonny are both doing well. She and her husband are both doing well. Well, this is great. You know where, um, uh, you know where we're taping this thing? Do you know Texas A&M very well? No, sir. Not a bit. Okay. Well, I'm going to.